This week on Spoke TV, a University of Waterloo startup company wins a non-equity grant for creating a robot that they hope will save lives. Right now, the most common method of diffusing landmine is control explosion. The problem with that is it destroys a lot of the local infrastructure. And Connoisseur College students took a plunge to raise money for a good cause. Plus, alopecia patients gain some self-esteem back with an unexpected procedure. It was difficult, sort of, uh, moving forward and looking very different and, have a, and having other people look at me very different. I'm Megan Spotswood. And I'm Peter Scott. And this is Spoke TV, your source for local weekly news produced by second year journalism broadcast students from Conestoga College. Following the recent ice storm, many people found that trees had caused major damage to their property and weren't sure how to deal with it. Spoke TV's Sarah McKeever branches out to find the roots of the issue. Severe weather can happen during any season, especially in southwestern Ontario. Whether it be thunder and lightning or mass amounts of ice and snow, the trees in our neighbourhoods are being put at risk of damage. First and foremost, if there are hazardous conditions surrounding any damaged trees or power lines, 911 should be the first call. For anything else, if you're in the city of Kitchener, there's a 24-hour number to call to report these sorts of damages or even anything that the city should be aware of. Scott Barry is the Interim Associate Director of Operations with the Infrastructure Services Department for the City of Kitchener and he says that the hotline is there as an outlet for residents to reach out to the city. So we would encourage residents to definitely be aware of their environment, especially after a storm, and uh, let us know if there's any way we can help. Reporting damages is one of the most common calls that the centre receives, even more so following severe weather. The most recent ice storm we had in uh, March of 2016, we had about 2,000 calls uh, over a five-day period. And compare that to the December 2013 event, we had roughly 4,000 calls. The city, however, isn't always responsible for the cleanup of damaged or downed trees. If the tree is on private property, such as a backyard, and not interfering with city sidewalks or roads, then it's up to the property owner to take care of it. Andrew Wood works for Tri-City Tree Service and says that when they're out cleaning up downed trees, there's only one factor that they really take into consideration. The number one priority is always safety. What you have to remember is there's a lot of things around, fences, houses, decks, and we always want to make sure that people are aware that we're taking every precaution when working around those. So after that, it's always about what's the fastest and most precise way that we can do the job that we're trying. If you need to call the city to report damaged trees, the number to call is 519-741-2345. If you have trees down near your home but are unsure about who is responsible for cleaning them up, contact the city anyways and the response teams will work with you to find the best solution. For Spoke TV, I'm Sarah McKeever. Although landmines were created as weapons of war, the majority of casualties have been civilians, often coinciding with refugees returning to heavily mined areas. Spoke TV's Lindsay Griesbach spoke with a local who experienced this firsthand and decided to do something about it. Over the past several decades, Kitchener has developed a reputation for being a hub for startup tech companies. Velocity, a leading entrepreneurship program based out of the University of Waterloo, is the biggest startup incubator in North America, offering grants and workspace to promising new companies. One of the most promising of these new companies is called Landmine Boys, who has designed a robot prototype to safely disarm landmines. Richard Yim, co-founder of Landmine Boys and a fourth-year mechanical engineering student at the University of Waterloo, says it would be a much better alternative to the current method. Right now, the most common method of diffusing landmine is control explosion. The problem with that is it destroys a lot of the local infrastructure like road, uh, waterway, and if it's close to home, it could damage the village themselves. But also the farmland, you need to clean it up and repurpose it before you can do farming or, or, or other agricultural purpose. Yim immigrated to Canada from Cambodia when he was 13 and has seen firsthand what landmines can do. He has lost family and friends to the explosions they cause and has gone back to test their prototype in his home country. He has been offered office space at Velocity and plans to take it, with high hopes of putting his robot into action on live landmines within the year. Each year, Velocity holds three competitions, and for each competition, they award four startup companies a non-equity grant of $25,000 to help them accelerate their projects. Jude Fiorillo, the Marketing Communications Manager at Velocity, explains what they saw in the Landmine Boys and why they awarded them one of these $25,000 prizes on March 31st. Uh, Landmine Boys um, 
has participated in the past in the Velocity Fun 5K competition last fall. They didn't win, but they've come a long way since then. You know, they've built a great team. Uh, they have a prototype that they're working on that works really well. Um, and there's just a lot of promise with their technology. For Spoke TV, I'm Lindsay Griesbach. Dogs are more than just man's best friend. They can help the visually impaired, detect seizures, and aid police in bomb and drug detection. But what few people know is they can also help with post-traumatic stress disorder. Spoke TV's Ali Sieber Payton visits National Service Dogs in Cambridge to find out more. Chad Myron, a Canadian veteran, served in Afghanistan from May 2010 to December 2010. When he returned, he began a new battle with post-traumatic stress disorder. Norman is Chad's PTSD service dog. The Canadian veteran has been on a five-year recovery and he says Norman has helped more than therapy and medication. He does all kinds of crazy stuff. He's got lots of different commands for helping in uh, situations, especially out in public. Chad got Norman from the National Service Dogs located in Cambridge. Service dogs aren't only for the blind, they're also for helping veterans with PTSD. A survey done in 2013 showed that 18.9% of regular forest members who had been deployed reported symptoms of PTSD or similar disorders, which is almost double from 2002. NSD trains dogs to help veterans with PTSD. Currently, they're in the puppy stage and are just learning some basic commands. In the next couple of months, they will learn more commands specifically for PTSD service. They will be fully trained by the time they are two, and they will be ready to serve to those with the disorder. Annie Banks from NSD talks about the process of training. But majority of it is two years, uh, and then when they're done their training, the uh, clients that will be getting them come here to our facility, and they spend a week here and do. Uh, they learn everything about the dogs, um, how to brush their teeth, clip their nails, all how to use all their skills, um, and after that week, they go home with the clients. The program launched in 2011, and they were the first Dog Assistance International accredited training school in Canada. I noticed that I was angry all the time, and uh, yeah, things just started adding up. For Spoke TV, I'm Ali Sewer Payton. Alopecia is an autoimmune disease in which hair is lost from some or all areas of the body. Spoke TV's Shruti Rajagopalan talks to an alopecia patient to find out how they feel about it. I was diagnosed in al with alopecia in 2011. Michelle Bloom's condition has put her in and out of hospitals and has caused her to suffer from low self-esteem for several years now. Alopecia is an autoimmune disease and it affects anyone of any age, both men and women. And basically what happens is your hair follicles are rejected by your body and your hair falls out. Alopecia patients go through a lot of struggles in the society. My hair was part of my identity and it was difficult. Um, it was difficult sort of uh, moving forward and looking very different and, have a, and having other people look at me very different. But some of the pain was long gone after she found out about the henna planet. Basically, I offer henna parties. Um, I do henna at events. I do henna for brides. I do belly blessings, so henna on a pregnant belly. Um, and tattoo trials. Anything anybody wants to have henna for, um, they would, you know, they can hire me, basically. Henna Planet Company aims to empower women who have lost their hair due to cancer treatment or alopecia. And today, one of the world's top henna artists transformed the patient's head into a work of art. Takwin Singh has been a henna artist for 10 years now. The point of Henna Planet is to connect cancer and alopecia patients with artists who beautify sufferers with ornate henna crowds. Singh used natural henna which will last for about 15 to 20 days. For me, safety is a big issue. When I do my own, when I do henna for a henna crown, or if I'm doing it for my own business, I make sure that it's all natural henna. It's completely safe. I make it myself, so I know exactly what's put into it. Um, I know that there's no chemicals in it. This movement is expanded far to the world, including Australia, 
रशिया इसराइल साउथ अफ्रीका एंड पाकिस्तान दिस ग्लोबल नेटवर्क इंक्लूड्स मोर देन 250 फिफ्टी आर्टिस्ट है somebody feel good about themselves because you're applying something and making them look beautiful um but also in the process you're touching them and you're touching them in a positive way bloom shares how she feels about the results of the crown absolutely wonderful there isn't there isn't a feeling like it this unpredictable autoimmune disease that we live with every single day and anything that can help you know move towards acceptance and and just living with every single day anything that you can do that's helpful to do that and and Hannah Crown does that it just feels freedom for them because it's just a beautiful design that they're able to be themselves and be accepted for who they are the best part is the happiness the patients get when they catch the sight of their oh crowns my oh my goodness <laughs> I got you like it. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> so, the, so the coverage is really important. Mm -hmm. So when I look in the mirror, so <coughs> I see the I see the crown. Right. So you can see it. So yeah. I don't see the so uh this is the only time that I see that I don't see bald and I see yeah. and I see, and I see the design and right. I see the henna. Yeah. Which is really nice. Yeah. 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 Great. It's beautiful. This is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. For Spoke TV, I'm Shruti Rajakopalan. Drones available for public purchase raise concerns from authorities and airport officials as to how dangerous they can be. Users may be unaware of the regulations surrounding their usage. Spoke TV's Carmen Ponciano has the story. Drones are becoming more popular since practically anyone can use them, but they can become a problem when they are not used responsibly. Transportation Canada has set regulations when it comes to flying drones, including not operating one within 9 kilometers of an airport. Even though drones can be used for commercial purpose or just for fun, so far this year there have been 15 close encounter incidents near Ontario airports, mostly reports from pilots saying that they have spotted these drones close to their aircrafts while in flight. Steve Gray, owner of Flycraft in Kitchener, says that the majority of people who buy them for fun aren't aware of the regulations that come with owning one, especially when they are bought online. I don't think most people are aware. I think the people that buy them for commercial purposes might be aware, but the people that just buy them for fun, no. They, fl they, they treat them like a model airplane, which for the most part is quite safe. We've been flying model airplanes for 50 years or more. But um, when you can fly something that's so easy to fly now, the drone's all automated, and it's capable of flying out of sight and higher than you can see it and farther than you can see it then of course you have new problems. And due to recent events, Transportation Canada is going to be revising the regulation policy. According to Chief Officer Mike Hafner, the consequences that come with violating controlled airspace, like airports, can be serious. There's a number of consequences if we look at it from a consequence perspective. Uh, most often uh, we look at it from a criminal perspective being uh, criminal negligence. That would be uh, the one of the most appropriate charges being laid. However, one quick way to avoid close calls is by visiting the Transportation Canada website when purchasing a drone. For Spoke TV, I'm Carmen Ponciano. Maple syrup is considered a sweet sign of spring and festivals around the region draw in many visitors annually. But this year's warmer than normal winter caused some problems for local maple syrup producers. Spoke TV's Kelly Golden tapped into this. It's maple syrup season, which means lots of festivities are taking place in and around the region. The production of maple syrup is a sweet but intensive job, and the weather plays a huge role. Owner of Shady Grove Maple Farm, Dan Gates, explains the impact the weather has had on the production of maple syrup this year. Oh, the weather's been tough. Uh, right through even fall, late fall into uh, the beginning of winter, there was really no winter. Then when we did get it, we get those thaws. So we decided to tap super early this year. Things started much earlier this season, with most maple farms tapping around the middle of February, two weeks earlier than normal. Despite the warmer spring-like weather we've been having, there's still plenty of maple syrup to go around for all the festivals taking place. Program coordinator at Westfield Heritage Village, Lisa Hunter, says that maple syrup festivals are still in full swing regardless of the weather. It was much earlier this year, so fortunately we were able to get the taps in uh, quite early in February, so we've been um, producing since then. Uh, we're not sure, depending on how the weather goes, how long the season will last, but it's definitely running today. 
Once the trees start to bud, the season is over, meaning that this one could be short but sweet. It's just been really wacky. We'll freeze up for five days and then we'll thaw right out and not freeze. And we need a freeze thaw, freeze thaw to make the sap go up and down the tree. For Spoke TV, I'm Kelly Golden. Thanks, Kelly. There are a lot of musicians in the region, but some of them face more challenges than others. Spoke TV's Lindsay Griesbach spent today with Fergus pianist Kara Shaw. She was two and a half when she started playing the piano. She is uh, on the, the autism spectrum, uh, very mild autism, what they really refer to as Asperger's syndrome, uh, but she's also a musical savant, and the statistics say that Kerr is one of a hundred musical savants around the world. Her ability to be able to hear any piece of music and to play it back is absolutely incredible. Playing the piano takes patience, talent, and a lot of practice, but there is one important thing pianists often take for granted, eyesight. Not only is 26-year-old Kara Shaw autistic, but she was born completely blind. Being raised in a musical family, however, she didn't let that hold her back. I played Pomp and Circumstance for my own kindergarten graduation, and then when I was six, I played for my kindergarten teacher's wedding. The piano made sound and that kept her attention so that I could keep her attention longer while I tried to figure out if she could see the keys. I don't think she ever saw them, but it didn't take long for her to learn how to play. A flat. Okay. The tall? Um, the small tall? It's an A. Okay. It's an F sharp. Okay. I like playing piano because it's, because uh, it sounds angelic. It makes me feel happy and I guess like a stress reliever. What are some of your favorite songs to play? Uh, Once Upon a Dream is one of them. A Whole New World. She was fascinated with chords and her hands were so tiny she could, couldn't play a triad with one hand. It took two hands. And so she would play the chords with both hands and she would sing the melody. And when she got better, um, she would try to get no, more notes and if she couldn't reach them, she would play with her elbows or she'd get her feet up on the keyboard and she would be playing feet and hands to get the notes that she, she wanted to get. She would do whatever it took to get the sound she wanted. After having three healthy boys and then a daughter born with cystic fibrosis, Dave and Linda Shaw decided that they couldn't risk having another child, so they went to Children's Aid to adopt one with special needs. There she is, born at 23 weeks. They told my birth mom, Stacy, that if I didn't respond within 48 hours, they were going to basically let me go. You know, have me, well, let me die kind of thing. When they phoned and said they had Kara, she was premature and she was blind, and that was all I knew, but I knew that that was the baby. I just, just right away it felt right. She is a, so was born, you know, at 23 weeks and so tiny, and yet her spirit is so large. Yep. This is a scene from Breaking Bad. Kara just has a different way of looking at life. It's, it's, um, just, it, it's simple, it makes perfect sense, and I think we all need to learn to live like Kara does. She's always up. Kara is always, always up. Love having her part of the show, her positive energy, and, and just, um, she just adds to it. And I, I just love the fact when I come up behind her, she knows it's me. <laughs> I don't have to say a word. It's a crazy family. Five kids, and they all play musical instruments, but three of them doing it professionally, so. If I didn't give my kids anything else, I gave them music. <laughs> Hockey is such a big winter sport in Canada, and the Waterloo Warriors take time out of their busy schedule to share their skills with young girls who want to learn the game. Megan Spotswood has more on the local girls team, the Rookie Ravens. Falling down and learning how to get back up is only one of the skills that the Rookie Ravens hockey program teaches to young girls. And who is there to pick them up? The University of Waterloo men's hockey team. 
Rookie Ravens is a program designed for young girls ages 5 to 7. It teaches them the fundamentals of hockey with the main goal being fun. The program provides a safe environment for young girls to learn and develop their hockey skills. Most girls continue on to other levels when Rookie Ravens is over. The University of Waterloo men's hockey team has been volunteering with Rookie Ravens for four years now, helping them learn the basics such as stick handling, passing, shooting and skating. Brian Bork, University of Waterloo men's hockey head coach and also coach of the Bantam AA Ravens hockey team, feels like the guys on the team and rookie Ravens both benefit off of each other. We're also, you know, trying to connect with the kids. We, we talk to our instructors like, oh, that's a big part of it. We want the girls to have fun and want to come back and work hard. So they talk about working hard and giving your best and, and you know, enjoying each other and celebrating goals for everyone and just trying to, to, try to build the, the whole side of it, if you will. University of Waterloo men's hockey player Mitch Elliott feels like this is a great learning experience for not only himself but for his um, team. Well, it's it's amazing to me to see this many girls involved in in hockey. Um, like when I was growing up, it, there wasn't this much involvement, and um, you know it's amazing to see the way the game is growing, and uh, you know I, it really makes me feel good to be a part of that. Lisa Hutzflout says that her daughter Danica enjoys the social interaction between the university team and the girls. They've created a really fun and safe environment where Danica feels challenged um, but not intimidated to try new things. Waterloo Ravens thrives on being for the kids, for the game, for the fun of it. For Spoke TV, I'm Megan Spotswood. Conestoga College held their annual Polar Plunge to raise money for breast cancer awareness. Spoke TV's Natalie McCallum dives into the story. Conestoga Students Incorporated, also known as CSI, held their annual Polar Plunge on March 2nd at the Conestoga College Dune Campus. CSI was able to raise over $1,050 in just cash donations. This doesn't include their online fundraising, which has yet to be totaled. The proceeds raised were donated to the Breast Cancer Society. Its main focus is to save lives through breast cancer research with a vision to end breast cancer completely. CSI President Jeff Shear feels the event brings the community together. It helps us to give the opportunity for students to get more involved in our community, uh, raise money for a good cause, uh, and as well as just have community representatives come out to the college as well. Prizes were also rewarded to the students who raised the most cash donations as well as had the best costumes. Raquel Lopez, a Conestoga student who dressed up as Batgirl, was one of the many who participated. We all believe that it's a great cause in order for, you know, cancer patients and survivors um, to keep going because we all know that it's a really tough battle. CSI provided hot chocolate and soup for the jumpers and each one was given a towel that said, I survived the polar plunge. For Spoke TV, I'm Natalie McCallum. So Peter, if you were to do the polar plunge, who would you dress up as? I don't think I could do it. I find the cold unbearable. <laughs> That's all we have for you this week for Spoke TV. I'm Peter Scott. And I'm Megan Spotswood. For more news and information, visit SpokeTV.ca or follow us on Twitter. Yeah, yeah I don't think.